Kia ora. My name is Josh Wolf. I'm a developer advocate at Kamunda, and this is getting started with Kamunda Cloud using Golang. Uh, in this walkthrough, I'm going to be going through these instructions here, uh, which I wrote and which you can find in the Kamunda Cloud documentation. I'll put a link at the bottom of the video if you came here through YouTube. Now, to do this, you're going to need Go 1.13 or later installed on your machine. And I've got 1.14 on my machine. And you're going to need some kind of IDE, um, like I use Goland. You could use, um, there's a bunch of different ones. You could even use VS Code for this. Okay, let's go. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to scaffold a new project. So we're going to make a project directory. You can also start it in your IDE, but I'm just going to do it like this. Okay, so if I now do an LS, yep, I got it there. So I'm going to CD into this new directory that I just created. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add the ZB Go client to the project. So I just copy and paste this command. 80% of programming is knowing which code sample from Stack Overflow to copy and paste. The other 50% is debugging. Okay, looks pretty good. Okay, so now we have our project here. Nah, nothing really to see in it at the moment. We'll get to writing some code in a minute. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create a Commander Cloud cluster. To do that, we're going to go to kamunda.io, and if you don't already have a Kamunda Cloud account, you'll be able to open one here for free. I already have one. I may even be logged into my account right now. Looks like I am. Cool, so it's going to pull up my dashboard. I'm going to see the, the various clusters that I have. I have a couple of different ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this ASP.NET starter cluster. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. Delete. Goodbye. And then I'm going to create a new cluster. So pretty easy to do that. You just click on create new cluster. Now your layout may look a little different from mine because I've got access to like um, internal dev channels and stuff. But you know, you're going to create a development cluster ZB0241 and I'm going to call it Cloud Starter. This could be any name you like at all. This is just really a um, human readable identifier. So I just say add. Now it takes a second or so and then it'll pop up into my, my uh, dashboard here and you can see it's got a little red dot and it says creating so that one's being deployed into the kubernetes infrastructure and it's hosted in europe west 1d which is a google data center in belgium so while that one's baking i can actually click into it so i click on there we're going to create some client connection credentials so i click on clients and i click create new client. This is like an API key. Again, this is a human readable name. So I'm just going to call it cloud starter. It can be anything that you like. And there it is. So I've got a client ID or a client secret that I can copy. And I have some connection information here, which is a kind of a handy environmental configuration block. Now for our project, we're going to environmentalize our configuration, uh, you know, following good 12 factor app kind of principles. But we're going to use go.env to be able to read it from a configuration file. So we're going to go ahead and add the go.env package as a dependency to our project. Done. And then we're going to create a .env file. So I might open my IDE to get to that part. So I'm going to open goland. Here it comes. I quite like these um, IDEs from Intel, uh, IntelliJ. Yeah, they make some nice stuff. Um, I use VS Code a lot. I program a lot in JavaScript. And uh, when I'm programming in Go or in Java or Kotlin, I use the IntelliJ IDEs. So I've got it in Workspace. Mm, no, I don't. I have it in, let's find out where it is. My Go Home. Let's find out where that is. Workspace Golang source, okay. So Workspace Golang source github.com, cdeparty, cloud starter, open. So you could just set these environment variables at the, um, you know, in the terminal, but really we, we want to make it so that we uh, can sort of automate that. So this go.env is very, very useful for that. So I'm going to add a new file, new file. It's going to be called .env. And you would want to add this .env file to your .gitignore so that you don't go checking your secrets into a repository. Now I'm going to grab my client credentials from here. 
these ones that I created. So I click on copy and I can go back to my IDE, drop them in here, and then I can remove all of these export command keywords like that because they're not needed. Um, we won't worry about integrating, I'll use the terminal. And then I just go ahead and save that. Okay, next step. So I think we're gonna start, yeah, we're gonna start writing some code now. So we're gonna create a main.go file in here. So a new go file, we'll call it main. Is it gonna put a .go on it? Yes, it does, good. And we'll change this of course to package main, but let's just copy and paste the entire code sample and then I'll walk you through it. 80% of programming, knowing which code sample to copy and paste. Okay, so what we do here is we've got our imports, pretty standard stuff. We have a main function. And what we do is we have a function that generates or creates a, a ZB client. In here, in the, in the get client function, which returns the zbc.client, the first thing we do is we call go.env.load and what that will do is it'll find this .env file and load that into the environment of the program. At the moment, we have to explicitly set the gateway address by grabbing the zb address which is in our .env file. The other ones get automatically picked up by the client and I've actually opened a patch to make it so that in the future you won't even have to put this in. So it makes it very easy to run your applications against Commander Cloud, against a locally hosted broker, um, against a self-hosted broker running somewhere in the cloud or on another machine on your network without having to change your code. You just change the settings in the .env file. So we load the .env file and then we create a ZB client and then we just return that. So now that we have a ZB client, we have a get status function. We pass the ZB client into that get status function. So you can see that down here. So we grab the, the context background and then what we do is we create a new topology command for the cluster and we send it, we pass the context in so that it can run um, asynchronously. And then we get the response back and then what we do here is we just iterate over that response and then we print out something that looks good for the um, for the terminal. So actually we'll use the log rather than FMT and a bit of enumeration here to make it um, human readable. All pretty straightforward stuff. So I can now just run this with go run main.go, enter. It's going to reach out to my cluster, allow, and it's going to get a topology. So it's going to get the status and it gets the topology. And so you can see here the response, there's one broker and it's a leader. And this is the broker address here. And this is actually the internal um, resolvable name inside the Kubernetes infrastructure. So you can't actually connect to it with this name. That's not um, resolvable from outside the cluster. From outside the cluster, we're using you know, an address of this format here. Okay, so we've created a cluster, we got some client connection credentials, and then we use that to connect to the cluster from a Go application, and then query that cluster for its topology. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create a BPMN model. BPMN is business process model and notation. It's an XML format that can be graphically represented, and it's how you design workflows for ZB. To do that, we're going to use the ZB Modeler, which you can download. You won't have to log in here. This is because I'm a committed to the project. I've got like an additional layer of authentication I have to go through. But this will jump you straight to the releases page in this repository. And once it comes up, you can see here the latest version is 091. And we've got modelers for Linux, Mac, and two flavors of Windows, 32 and 64-bit. Now, I'm on Mac, and I already have... Um, the ZB modeler installed, so I'm just going to go ahead and open that. Great, so we're going to create a new process diagram. There's a bit of product placement here. Come on, da. Eighty percent knowing which um, code sample to cut, copy and paste from Stack Overflow. Fifty percent debugging and twenty percent staying hydrated. Okay, create a new BPMN diagram, embiggen. Make it bigger so that we can see it more easily, good. This is a start event, it's automatically there. I'm gonna give it a, 
a, re a reasonable name, start. Then we're going to create a task and then an end event, end. So I click on the task and here you see this little icon. It's a wrench or a spanner. I click on that and I change it to a service task. Then I'm going to change the name of the service task to get time. And over here in the panels, the properties panel, under type, I'm going to call it get minus time. Now, I apologize that I can't make that properties panel any bigger, but that's get dash time. No spaces, all lowercase, get and then hyphen or dash time. Now, if I click on the blank space here in the canvas, that gives me the properties for the entire process. And I'm going to give the entire process a name, which is how we can um, refer to this process from our application. And I'm going to call it test dash process. Test hyphen process, no spaces, all lowercase. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. And I'm going to save it into my workspace. Golang source github.com cedar party cloud starter and I'm going to call it test dash process BPMN. Now, again, this is just an arbitrary human readable name. Personally, I like to name my model file names after the process ID, which makes it easy for me to correlate them um, at design time. If I go back to my ID, you can see it's appeared in here. And if I go ahead and open it, in the IDE, if I can, yeah, you can see here that it, that it is in fact XML. And in the modeler, you can view the XML down the bottom here. And you can actually directly edit the XML in here if you need to. But we don't need to do that right now. So what we're going to do now is we're going to deploy this process, work, this workflow definition into the Komunda Cloud cluster. So to do that, I'm going to go back to my instructions. And if we have a look down here, we're going to add a new function called deploy. So we've got get status. We're going to add a new function in here called deploy. And then we're going to call it from in the main function. And we're going to pass in again the ZB client. Get status and then deploy. Let's have a look at the deploy function itself. So similar thing, we inject a ZB client into this function. Um, we grab the, the background context and here we have a new deploy workflow command. We add a resource file, testprocess.bpmn. Uh, it's relatively pathed. And then we send it to the, to the cluster. And we're going to get back a response. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to print the response, converting it to a string out to the log. So what we should expect to see here when we run the program is that we get the topology response. And then we get a deployment command response. Let's go ahead and run that. Allow. Okay, there's our deployment, our topology, and here's our deployment. So it has a key, which is the unique key that identifies this process uh, in the cluster. But you never really have to, to use that. Here are the workflows that got deployed. BPMN process ID. Okay, it looks like I made a mistake in there because that BPMN process ID should be uh, test process. Let me go back to my modeler. Yep, I put it in the wrong place. I put test process into the name rather than the ID. So in name, I give it a human readable name, test process, like that. I'll save that. Um, and then let's run it again, and it should redeploy. You'll notice also that it says version 1 here. OK, that looks better. So here I got this workflow deployed, the BPMN process ID is now test process, which is, a, which is what I would expect it to be, and it's version 1. Now, if I run the program again, I'll get back a deployment response, but it won't increment the version. So it's idempotent. You can, idempotent, you can deploy as many times as you want, and it'll only create a new version in the cluster if there has been a change in the hash of the diagram between uh, you know, your current deployment and the previous one. So there's no problem. You're not going to create limitless versions of it by continuing to just deploy it like that. OK, great. So we created a model, and we deployed it into the cluster. Let's create an instance of a workflow using that model. 
Now we're going to provide our little application with an HTTP REST interface so that we can just use a web browser to, to send commands to it if you like. So we're going to create a bound handler and I'm using a similar approach here to what I did with deploy and get status and that I'm injecting a or passing in a, uh, a ZB client in order to have it in scope. So I can keep my main function pretty dry and quite um, high level and semantic. And I have a, uh, a bound handler that comes back. So this is just a, a route handler for the HTTP server. But inside there, I have a reference to the ZB client and I use the client to create a new create instance command. Here I specify the BPMN process ID, which is test process. I specify the latest version and then I send it. And then I just write the response from the, the cluster as the response to the HTTP request. So we're gonna need to create the HTTP server. So just grab these two lines here drop those into the main function, save that. Uh, I, I thought about using Revel, I think it's called, for this uh, demo, but I just went ahead and used the, the standard Go server. <coughs> there was no need to, to involve a framework. Okay, we're up and running. We're listening on port 3000. If I now go to my browser and open localhost, 3000 start I get back the response from the broker which is that we've started a new workflow instance this is the key of the definition that was used the BPMN process ID of the definition the version of the definition and here's my unique workflow instance key which identifies the instance of the workflow that was just started so what we can do now is we can go into what's called operate which is the graphical UI for the cluster so if I go back to my uh, cluster console and I go back to the overview for this cluster cloud starter down the bottom here you can see workflow instances view and operate so I just go ahead and click on that link and now opens the operate instance so when I deploy a new cluster and come into cloud I deploy a ZB broker uh, an operate instance which is this application here and an elastic search instance the ZB broker will execute commands and um, you know do different things to the uh, the workflow instances, and every time it performs some kind of action, it exports an event into Elasticsearch, and then operate reads the Elasticsearch database, and then generates a like a projection of the running state. So you can see here I have test process one instance and one version. If I click on that, I get. This is an aggregated view here actually. So if I had 10 processes running, I would see 10 here and then I would see the individual instances down here. I have one instance running right now. If I click on that instance ID, you can see that here is the instance ID and it's started and there's a token waiting at the get time service task. So there's a job of type get time waiting for some worker to service it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a worker to service the get time task. So we'll go back here to the copy and paste place, uh, creating a new job worker. So it's kind of similar to creating this HTTP route in that we have like a handler function. So I'm going to drop the handler function into my little application. And then I'm going to create the worker here in the main function. Now, in order for the worker to be listening, running at the same time as the HTTP server, they're both kind of two background processes that are, you know, um, the way the worker works is that it's continually polling to the, uh, to the broker. And I think by default, it's about every 60 seconds and it's a long poll. So it asks, do you have any jobs of type get time for me to serve? and it just waits for 60 seconds or until the broker returns some jobs to work on. If it gets to 60 seconds, it'll close the connection and then re-ask again. And then when it does get back some jobs to work on, it'll invoke this handler for each of the jobs that it receives. Now, in our handler, all we're gonna do is we're gonna log out the job that gets received so that you can see the data you know, that, that's available to work with inside this handler. Then we're gonna 
do a new complete job command and for that we need to pass in the job key so that we can you know the broker can correlate that complete command with a particular workflow instance and then we'll send it and so you know we pull the job key off the job data itself okay so I'm gonna save that and then I'm gonna go ahead and restart my application with go run main go go run main dot go to be precise and you can see here that my service task with my job for that task that was waiting has now been served by the worker and it's just logged out the job data here you can see there's a this is the uh, mm, interesting that it doesn't give you the fields so let me see if I can guess what they are that 60 must be like a that the job so this is the job key here that's the unique key that represents that job in uh, in the broker in the workflow the job type this key here is I'm not sure what that is test process one five one it doesn't map to that either this is the actual name of the service task um, not as like the which type of service task is it but which specific instance is it within the workflow so if we go back into operate we'll get into a little bit more about the different think parts of the job that you can use inside your handler but if I go back to operate I can see here that my workflow is now completed because my worker grabbed that waiting job and then it completed it and then the broker flowed the token on to the, the end event in this case completing this workflow totally so what we're going to do now is we're going to await the outcome of a workflow because if we go here I can start another instance of the workflow it'll now run to completion you see here the worker serviced it but I have no information about the outcome of the workflow the only information that I got back in this case was I started a workflow here's some data about it but you know what happened like if it's a, a loan application approval process for example and I want to know whether the loan was approved or not approved I need that information to come back to me so I can do that by modifying my um, command here and adding with result to this uh, builder pattern so if I go back to here we can go down and have a look so all we need to do is after the latest version we just say with result and that's it it's pretty easy so here I just say with result and then send that so I save that I'm gonna restart my program allow wait for the topology deployment all good now if I go back here and I start an instance of the workflow what we should expect to see here now is the same data but also the outcome of the workflow itself so if I request that the only difference here as you can see is that I got variables back as well and that's the final variable payload of the workflow so this is where all of the data is stored in the workflow and if you're storing things like large binary blobs and you know massive document XML documents JSON documents you wouldn't put them into the variables you would put a pointer in to a database or you know s3 or something like that and put the data outside of the workflow engine okay so now what we're going to do is we are going to do a rest call from inside that worker so we're actually going to have the worker do something and I have a, a rest API that I've created a JSON API all it does is it returns the current GMT time uh, as a JSON object so we're going to create a couple of structs to help us out here with uh, the typing of this boundary of our system so I'm going to put them here because they're related to this particular function the get time handler so we have two we have the time struct which is the this basically describes the return from the rest API and then we have the get time complete variable struct which is a description of the payload that we're going to send back with the complete command so in here I'm just going to replace the entire content with this and then I'll walk you through it so we just replace this content with that 
And what we do here, okay, we're going to replace, okay, automatically imported it, good. So what we're doing is we're, we're doing an HTTP get request to this address, json-api.joshwolf.com forward slash time. That's where we get our JSON time object from. Now, if that all comes back good, we're going to grab the response body and then we're going to unmarshal that into uh, a time variable, which we, you know, specify as being of this time struct type here. And so this struct has these JSON annotations on it so that it can demarshal the JSON into the struct for us. Pretty handy. Uh, and then to create our final payload, what we do here is we create a new get time complete variables struct and we put the time inside that in a field called time. It's kind of weird that there's a field called time that contains the time, but yeah, that's how I designed it. Stuck with it, it's technical debt now. Um, and then what we do here is when we send the complete command, we specify the job key for the job that we're completing. And we also specify variables from an object and we pass in that object. And then we just send that command. So what we should expect to see when we run this is in the output from our start command, we should expect to see the final variables contain the time from the JSON API. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this program from running and start it again. We're going to see the topology and then the deployment. Okay, great. Now when we run this, I have to allow that. There we go. So the workflow is completed. The worker has reached out over REST. It's grabbed this GMT time object from the API, and then it's put it into the payload of the workflow. Great. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a decision in our workflow based on some aspect of the payload from a previous task. Pretty common sort of uh, use case, make a decision. So to do that, we go into our model again. We're going to modify this model. So we'll stretch this end event out to here. And we're going to drop a decision and gateway in there. And then we're going to have two branching gateways from here. Sorry, two branches from this gateway. Can take one or two different paths. Drop that out of the way. And from here, they both go to the end. And we'll make it kind of Let's make it sort of symmetrical. If I do this, uh -huh. no problem. It's not really symmetrical yet. Let's try this. Mm, close enough for rock and roll, hey? Okay, so like that. Cool. So this is a, 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 an exclusive parallel gateway. So when the token exits the service task, the worker completes the task, the broker is going to move the token into this gateway, and then it's going to examine the payload, and it's going to take one of these two paths. So to put the conditions on here, we're going to do that using the properties panel. So I, I select the branch itself, and this is going to be before noon before noon. So we'll move that label up there. Now the condition itself is specified in a language called feel, which stands for friendly enough expression language. And the condition expression here is equals, that's how you start all of these, time dot hour. So that's a reference to the variable payload. Time dot hour is greater than zero. So that's from 1 a.m. in the morning. And time.hour is less than 12. So any time between 1 and 11 is considered before noon. Makes sense, right? So that's the branch that will take in that case. Now for the second branch here, we could create, try to create like, you know, um, another logical statement that covers all of the cases. But if we make a mistake in the logic there and we miss something, it'll actually throw or raise an incident, which is kind of like throwing an error at the broker engine level. To avoid that, we can just click on here and say default flow. And it acts like a case statement in that if this case 
here matches, it'll take this flow. And if that case does not match, it'll take this one here. So it's like a default fall through um, case. So now we're going to turn these two tasks into service tasks. Again, I click on this little spanner wrench icon and choose service task like that. And then here, the name is make, uh, okay, no, we're going to use the same, what we're going to, let me explain this. What we're going to do here is we're going to use the same worker to serve both of these different um, service tasks. So the type is going to be called make dash greeting. And this one here, we're going to say is good morning. And this one here type again make greeting but this one is good afternoon now how do we specialize the behavior of the worker given that you know we want one to result in good morning the other one to result in good afternoon but we're using the same worker with the same task type we can do that using what's called custom headers so in my properties panel here I can click on headers and for the good morning task, I'm going to create a header. The key is going to be greeting. The value is going to be good morning. Of course, in a real application, you know, if you were internationalizing it, you would just use the value here would actually be like a lookup key for a localization table. But we're just going to keep it pretty simple for now and use directly the string itself. Greeting and the value is good afternoon. like that. Okay, so I'll save that process. And if I now restart my application, I would expect to see version two of my model deployed because the hash of the model has changed since I last made a deployment command for this model, in which case the broker will detect that and it will create a new version of the model. And then you can see here that in fact it does that and I now have version two of the model. Okay, so let's implement the worker for this task type. If I go down here, create a worker that acts based on custom headers. So I don't think we need all three of these structs actually, but let's have a look. So let's put the handler for that one above this one so we keep it close to the main function. I'm gonna grab the handler itself, drop it in here and yeah we only need one of those structs so i'll get rid of the other ones from the readme so all we need from here is the complete variables which is the typing of the payload that we're going to pass back to the engine because we're going to you know put that into a create a struct and then pass it in variables from object like we did in the last handler what's interesting here is that we get the variables from the job that gets passed into the handler as a map, which means that we can just do these kind of arbitrary string lookups. It's not very strongly typed. You can actually get variables as object, in which case you can have stronger typing on them. Um, custom headers, though, you can only get as a map. And so you can see here that we look up our custom header with the key greeting. We grab that. Uh, we grab the variable from the payload with the, with the key name. And then we create a greeting string where we just say greeting plus name. So good morning or good afternoon plus a name. And then we pass that in as a variable. And the name of the variable is say. You can see here we use JSON marshalling um, to set the actual name in the payload. Now one thing about this is that this worker has an expectation that there will be a variable that has a name a variable with the key name and a value in the payload. Our other worker doesn't do that, it just puts in a time. So we're going to put the name into the payload when we create the workflow instance. It's called the initial variables, the initial payload. So first of all, we're going to create an instance of our worker with that handler. So we go back to the main here and we just drop it in there. It's running in a go routine as well. So both of our workers are running in go routines. So they're running on their, their own threads. And we're going to modify our, our start handler. 
One thing we did here is we did with results. Now we're going to set some initial variables. So to do that, we're going to use a struct, get some typing on our payloads. Helps us with um, the correctness of the program. So we're going to create an initial variables and I'm going to use my name, Josh Wolf. You're welcome to use your own name here in your example. And then what we do is in our new workflow instance command, we, we're going to have to split it up actually. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, you can't completely chain this because we need to, we need to deal with if we're unable, you know, if the program is unable to create variables from this object, it's going to throw an error. So we have to handle that first. Then if we get a valid request, we can say we want this with the result and then send it and we get a response back. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to unmarshal that response and we are just going to return back the value of the say variable. We're not going to return back the entire thing. So if you have a look previously, we return back all of the stuff. What we're going to do now is we're just going to return back the single variable, which is the composite of the greeting that you know we selected based on the time of day and the name uh, you know that was initially passed in. So you know if you wanted to extend this, you could make that like a URL parameter um, or a route parameter. There will be a nice little kind of extension to make to this. Okay, everything kind of looks okay to me here, so I'm just going to run this and see. Okay, topology, deployment, still version 2 because no change to the hash of the model. And then if we start an instance, the worker wants to connect to the internet. Yep, you can do that. And there is the result. Good morning, Josh Wolf. So you can see that in our model, it's we've started an instance, we passed in a name. This is a hello world example. You probably picked that up by now. Um, our first worker reached out over HTTP REST and grabbed a JSON time object from a REST API. We made a decision based on the time of day. And then we invoked that create or make greeting worker with a custom header with a particular greeting string as the custom header. And then that make greeting worker took the greeting from the custom header, took the name from the initial variables payload, combined the two together, added it into the payload as the say variable. This all happens up here grab the custom header, grab the name, make the greeting string, add it into the workflow payloads as the say variable, and then down here where we awaited the outcome of the variable, which is in the bound handler here, we created a new instance, we set the name, we waited for the outcome, then we grabbed the variables from, from, the, from the outcome, and then we just passed the, the value of the say variable back to the rest requester. So there you go. That's a, a real basic getting started with Kumunda Cloud example, which shows you how to create a model, how to create a cluster in Kumunda Cloud, how to view your uh, workflows in Operate here. If we go to running instances, I'll show you one more thing in here. You have in running instances, you have filters, and at the moment, we're only seeing running instances, but I can click on finished instances, and I can see a bunch of them. And the last one that I ran is down here at version 2. If we take a look at it, you can see it shows you the pathway that our workflow took. Came in here, got the time, made a decision, took that branch pathway there, went to there. And you can step through the different um, sequences, the different... Uh, activities or actions that took place and then you've got your final variable payload down here and you can see it's got the name that we initially passed in it has the time from the get time worker and then it has the say variable that was created by the uh, make greeting worker and that we logged out here through our rest route so that's enough to get you started with Kumunda cloud and with go and you know you can explore the API documentation in your IDE. 
also the the zb repository on github um, to look at the source code for it and of course the zb documentation itself which has a bunch of stuff about modeling about um, the different api commands the different things that you can do with it like timers all that kind of good stuff but that's enough to to get you started with Commander cloud and the go client